So let's go to the book of Romans again. Book of Romans. Uh, we are preaching through the book of, of Romans. We're in chapter 1. Uh, last week we preached uh, on uh, verse 19 and 20. And actually on the creation, we saw that uh, creation proves there is a God that people just looking at creation can tell there is a God. Amen. We looked at that last weekend, but today we want to go to verse 21 and 22. 21 and 22. Let's read verses 21 and 22 of chapter 1 in Romans. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So last week we saw that creation leaves man without excuse. That's the last part we saw. And I said that this is the focus of Romans 1.18 through 3.18. Man has no excuse for his sin. No excuse for not receiving and submitting to God's word. No excuse for not believing in God and seeking God. No excuse for not receiving God's salvation. So man has no excuse for not receiving God's salvation. And today, we go here to this verse, and we see men refuse to glorify God. And that's how I titled my message this morning. Men refuse to glorify God. Because men have no excuse, they're under condemnation. And men are under condemnation, we see here, because when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Neither were thankful. When they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful. First, we see here in this verse, says, because when they knew him. We go back to the start of creation. Adam and Eve knew God. They knew God. God walked and talked with them in the garden until the point where they disobeyed God. They had to leave the garden. But Adam's descendants knew God through the witness of Adam himself as well. For nearly the first millennium, as since Adam lived good, to the good old age of, how many years did Adam live? 900 and? No? 930. Amen? 930. I have to test sometimes how much we know about the Bible. Amen? That's why I do that. Yes, he lived to the good old age of 930 years, we see in Genesis 5.5. He lived a long time. So he taught all his descendants, and they knew God, and we see this. We see this in Enoch. Enoch was the eighth from Adam. He knew God. He walked with God. He was raptured out of here. Amen? We see this in Noah's day as well. Noah knew God. But men knew God, and yet lots of them did not, we see here, glorify him as God. Lots of them didn't glorify him as God. So the, after Noah... The descendants of Noah, who populated the world after the flood, knew about the true God as well, from the witness of Noah and his sons. Because Noah lived about 350 years after the flood, and Shem lived about 500 years. Now, I want to look today at something here. From knowing God to becoming fools are five downward steps I want to look at. From knowing God into becoming fools. There are five downward steps. See, the thing is, man always talks about the age of the caveman. You know, my wife always says, I should have been born in the age of the caveman because that's how old-fashioned I am, she tells me. Okay? I should have been born in that time. I'm old school, she says. So, but I don't believe in the caveman in a way. See, I don't believe man started down there and slowly comes up here. Man started with God 
and slowly started going down. Amen? Man started with God and slowly started going down. So, we want to look at today at five downward steps from knowing God to becoming fools. Okay? First, they glorified him not as God. They glorified him not as God. Yet though men knew God, they did not glorify God as God. This means to honor him, to submit to him, to obey him, to love him. They did not honor him, they did not submit to him, and they did not obey him or love him. This began with Adam and Eve, as we just saw, and Eden. If they would have, if they glorified God as God, they would not have disobeyed his clear commandment about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, would they? But they did not glorify God as God. It all started with them. You know, and ever since, man does not want to glorify God as God. Adam and Eve knew God. They talked with God. They walked with God. And yes, they sinned. They had to go out of the garden. They told their descendants about God. But still, man started to sin more and more. And the first one was Cain, wasn't it? He disobeyed God. What did Cain do? He killed his brother. And then we see man started to sin more and more. And we come to the life of Noah and where God actually says, it repenteth me of having created man. That's how much in sin man was living. See, man today believe as the men did in Noah's time. Noah told the people, you know, God is going to judge all of us if we don't repent. God told Noah to build the ark because God was going to judge sin. And people mocked Noah. People laughed at Noah. People didn't believe it would happen. And what happened? The flood came. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The flood came. What happened to all the people? They drowned. Everything that was on life upon our earth, all the animals, everything that didn't go into the ark. How many people went into the ark? Noah and his wife, Noah's three sons and their wives. All the rest stayed out. They mocked him and laughed at him. They didn't believe that God was a, a God that would judge them. They knew God, but didn't glorify God as God. They still wanted to live for self instead of for God. But God did judge them, didn't he? We see today, we go out there and we speak to people. It hasn't changed much. People laugh at us. People mock us for telling them, yes, God is real, and you ought to believe that Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, came to this earth. He took your place on the cross. He took your sins upon him. He died for them. God was satisfied with what Jesus did. If you believe that, you can go to heaven. And they laugh at us, the same as they laughed at Noah. And when we tell them, and, but God will punish those that will reject what Christ has done for you, they don't believe it. If we tell them there is a hell, they don't believe there is a real hell. And yet the Bible tells us there is. The same as God told Noah, it is going to rain, and if you're not going to believe, you will be judged. The same thing. And it did rain. And the flood came. They were judged. I want to tell you today, if you're here without Christ, or if you're listening and you don't have Christ, you need to accept what Christ has done for you. Because as sure as the judgment of the, the flood came, the, as sure God will judge mankind today. Amen? Hell is a real place. But it is not made for man. 
It is made for Satan and his angels. But everyone that rejects the gift of God, which is eternal life and Jesus Christ, will go there. And it will happen. It will happen. That is what the Bible teaches us. Yeah, I read an article last week as I was sitting there waiting for my, uh, the oil change in the, my car. And I, I read there that one preacher, uh, she's a lady, she was a, a Baptist minister uh, close to, not far from here, anywhere close to Sparta somewhere. She says, I'm not a hellish preacher. I don't like preaching on hell. I think we have enough hell in this earth. Well, I am a hellish preacher. Amen? I still believe in hell. Because the Bible says hell is real. And the Bible says all who will not receive Christ as their personal Savior will have to go and pay what Christ already paid for them. And it will be eternal. It will be eternal. See, Noah... afterwards also told his descendants the same thing. God is real, and God is a just God. God is love, but God is just. Judge, God will judge all sin. Amen? God will judge sin. You know, I remember growing up, what my parents would always tell me, and one thing, they were very strict. We shouldn't steal. Stealing is wrong. And my dad would say, even one penny, if it's not yours, you don't take it. Stealing is wrong. And they would always teach me, if you do wrong, you cannot go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven. So that was their belief. What they knew, they taught me. You need to be a good boy. And yes, of course, we weren't always obedient. We'd, sometimes we'd fight and all kinds of things. But what I want to get at, they wanted us to know that we should be good people to be able to go to heaven because that's what they knew. They didn't know that being good people doesn't take us to heaven. They didn't know that. Because you can be a very good person and you still can't go to heaven if you don't repent of your sins. You still need to repent. These people knew God, but did not glorify him as God. How people today do the same thing. They know God, but they don't glorify him as God. You know... It wasn't only back then. This continued with most of Adam's children, beginning with Cain, and with Noah's descendants as well. They knew God, but didn't glorify him as God. How sad. I did that for so many years, and I'm so thankful. Today I can come, and I can say, thank you, God, for saving my soul. Thank you, because without you, I'd be lost. I give him honor and glory for everything I have, I am, and what I do. Without him, I can do nothing. Nothing. Amen? Neither were, they, neither were thankful. We see here, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Now, unthankfulness to God is a great sin. It is sin. Being unthankful to God is a great sin. Man owes absolutely everything to God. Everything. Amen? Man did not create himself. He did not create the world. Man did not make anything and does not own anything. And that is what man doesn't understand. You know, I always tell people, uh, people ask me, do you own a house? I don't own a house here in Canada. I do own one in Mexico, I say. But then I have to say again, well, it's God's house because he gave it to me. Amen? 
because I wouldn't have it if it wasn't for God. I would not have anything if it wasn't for him. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Amen? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Man is dependent on God for his very existence. For his very existence, we ought to be thankful for that. For his very strength. For his every breath. For his mind. For everything. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be standing here. You wouldn't be here today either. He gives us the breath to breathe. He gives us a mind to think. Without him, we wouldn't know how to work. Without him, we wouldn't know how to make money. Without him, we wouldn't know how to build a house. There would be nothing without God. Amen? Nothing. He is the creator of all, of everything. Everything man has ever seen or touched was made directly by God or was made from material that God made and kindly put at man's disposal. Everything. God made the earth, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything that's therein. We can build houses because of material God has provided. Amen? People make machinery, tractors, everything from material God has provided. We would have nothing if it wasn't for God. Nothing. And that is so beautiful that God tells us this here. You know, God, through Paul, teaches us so many things. We ought to be thankful for everything God gives us. Acts Chapter 17, verse 28 says, In God we live and move and have our being. In God we live, we move and have our being. It's in God. Peter Harms, and I, brother, Pastor Swatsky knows him well too, and I know there's some others here. He just went to be with the Lord because I believe he was saved. As far as I knew him. But you know, the thing is, what I want to get at here, God took his hand away. And what happened? He died. He died. The moment God will take his hand away from me being here, what will happen? I will, and so will you. With God, without God, we are nothing. Amen? We are nothing. And we need to be thankful every day. So not being thankful is a great sin. God made man in his own image as his companion with great mental and creative capacity. A body of miraculous ability and the gift of language. I look at my body and it just amazes me. See my fingers and how many parts they bend? how God made us, how my knees bend exactly as I'm supposed to walk, how God made us so perfectly. He put the ears, he didn't put the ears where the nose is. We'd look kind of strange. God made us perfectly, amen? And not just the outside. Look at all the organs inside of us. If one organ fails, the whole body suffers. Even those organs those that are the smallest organs are so important. And God put everything exactly in the right place. Exactly. How thankful we need to be. And he allows us to speak. Now, I do speak in tongues, if you want to know. Amen? Three different ones. Now, I'm talking languages. Now, I'm not going to start 
saying things here that you wouldn't understand, but I thank God. God has allowed me to preach Spanish. That's what I preach most, Spanish, German, and English. So yeah, I speak three different tongues. I thank God for the language that we are able to speak. We can communicate one with another. God made man ruler of the beautiful green earth with its glorious design atmosphere. Man is the ruler here. He's given us this beautiful land to watch over it. Amen? And look at it. The snow goes away. It gets warm. What happens? The trees start getting green. The grass starts growing. Everything is God's doing. How we should glorify our God. Amen? How we should glorify. They glorified him not as God. Even though they knew him, they were not thankful. They were not thankful. Instead of being thankful, man wickedly rewarded his creator with rebellion. This has been man's characteristic ever since Adam and Eve. He owes God everything, but he doesn't even thank God for his daily bread lots of times. You go to a restaurant and look at how many people thank God before they eat. Not many. Not many. Now, I would hope, as believers, if people see us in a restaurant, that believers at least would not be ashamed to say, thank you, Lord, for this food that you provide for our bodies. But I've seen believers in a restaurant, and they look around, nobody looking. Wow, that was fast. We should not be ashamed to thank God for what he gives us. How else will other people know that we are Christians? How will they know? We should always be thankful. Instead of thanking God, men murmur against him and blame him for the troubles that they have brought upon themselves. So many times. They did back then, they still do today. You know, uh, Proverbs 19.3 says, The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. Men just don't want to be thankful. They just don't want to be thankful anymore. And then we see the next downward step here. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So we look at both of them. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. One commentator put it this way here in this verse. He said, the corruption of man's heart was the product of his rebellion, the product of his not glorifying God as God and not being thankful to him. The verbs are errorist, indicative, passive, indicating action that happened at a certain time in the past and that happened to the subject, in this case, the heart. In other words, because of man's sin against God, his heart became corrupted. Man's heart is corrupted, isn't it? My heart was corrupted completely before God saved my soul. Completely. Man that doesn't know any human being that doesn't know Christ, the heart is corrupted. They need to repent. They need to believe that God sent his son and then sent him for them. So his son would take their place on the cross and pay eternal hell in their place because Christ paid the price in full. Because God doesn't want one person to suffer eternally. 
And that is something, it's so important that people understand. God does not want people to suffer. You know, ever since this has been the condition of man's heart, imaginations and heart are intimately associated. The heart has imaginations and thoughts. Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is exactly where God saw that man's heart was evil. His thoughts were evil. His imaginations were evil. This is before the flood. But the same thing today, God sees, look at everything that's going on in the world. The imagination of mankind is evil. They put God out of everything. His prayer was taken out of school years ago. Back, and I'm not such an old man yet, but when I was in school, there was prayer every morning. I went to school here in Straffordville. Every morning, there was a speaker in every classroom, and the principal would read a verse out of the Bible, and then would pray, and then we would sing the national anthem. Every morning. You don't see that in schools today, do you? June would probably know that as well, because she was teacher, how that used to be. It's taken out. But not only that, God want, they want to take God out of everything. Look at today how people speak against Christians everywhere. They're giving Christians fault and everything bad that's happening in the world when it's their own imaginations, evil thoughts. Amen? But became vain in their imaginations. You know, the imaginations became vain, we see. This means empty, of no value. Their imaginations became empty. They knew God, but their imaginations became vain, empty, of no value whatsoever. That's what vain means. They became vain. The heart became foolish and darkened. Instead of a high and noble thoughts, instead of truthful thoughts, man's heart became full of vanity, full of self, full of error, full of lies, and full of myths. How sad that people say it started with the caveman and slowly we're getting better. God says, we started with God, and slowly we are getting worse. Slowly we are getting worse. The world is not getting better. It just isn't. More and more we see they don't want God in their lives. They don't want to submit to God's authority. More and more we see this all the time. See, Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Desperately wicked. Now God says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, 19 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. The heart is wicked. It is wicked. 
we see it was from the start and it still is today. Their imaginations became vain and their foolish heart was darkened because they didn't glorify God as God, neither were thankful. And we see that today. So that's where we as believers come in. We need to tell people about Christ. We need to tell them there is hope, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Amen? There is light. Now for who is salvation? The Bible tells me for everyone, as I just heard some people say. Now I know there's the Calvinists that say, well, there's only those that are chosen. Some are chosen and some aren't. Some are chosen to go to heaven, some are chosen to go. No, that's not what the Bible teaches us. Salvation is for all. For all. What does that mean? Every soul. But God does tell us what the imaginations of man is, so we will not be discouraged when we see people do what they do and still pray for them and talk to them about Christ. Amen? So we won't be discouraged, and we still speak to them. We still speak to them. Now, I just noticed something Brother Neil told me the other day. He said he had counted how often I take off my glasses when I, when I preach. I go, wow, some people are paying attention to me. Amen? He said 18 times I had taken off my glasses as I was preaching. Wow. Because he's wanting to get me one of these things that you put here. I'm going to rip it off every time I take my glasses off. <laughs> so I guess I better not do that. Well, let's go back to our message here. Last of all, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It is amazing how foolish men can be and still think of himself as wise, isn't it? It is amazing. You know, uh, I read an article the other day about India, and, and I know a pastor that we support it, and the church in Mexico still supports him, where we started. He is in India, and he told us he came to preach for us in Mexico, and he told us what, what the belief is in India. He says, they actually, where there's a lot of rats, and you know these big rats? How many of us like rats? I don't. But he says they won't hurt them. They won't hurt the rats. They say they actually take off their shoes to go in there to give them water and food, and there's lots of rats. And then if there's one rat that will bite them on the great toe, on the big toe, that's a relative. Okay? That's a relative. Because they believe that some of their loved ones that have passed are reincarnated into rats. Some are reincarnated into cows. So the cows there on the, on the streets, they can be anywhere and people will go around them. They will not eat cow, uh, uh, beef at all because they believe it can be one of their family members. See, to us that is foolish. But to them it isn't. They believe they are wise. They believe that's how it is. See, that's the difference. They, how, how foolish people can become. How far they go away from God. How far they go away from God. And the cockroaches, I hate cockroaches, okay? In Mexico, we have lots of them. But they also bring them food. They believe those can be family members as well. So the insects as well. Not just cows, rats, but also insects. If there's something at just thinking about it, how can people come to the point that they actually worship what God created instead of the creator? They worship creation instead of the creator. Amen? 
You want to worship? Some worship the sun, some worship the sea, some worship themselves. But you don't want to worship the true God that made you. You know, I've had talks with people sometimes, and especially one man, I remember talking to him, and that was still in the first mission that we started in Mexico. And he said, you are wrong. You know, the, everything just evolved. Everything is from nothing. Life came from nothing, and the world, everything you see evolved from nothing. And he says, well, I actually don't believe that. I believe God created all things. And he also argued that we come from monkeys, as I said last week. He says it's proven. There's even pictures how a monkey slowly became a man. Yeah, anybody can draw a picture. Anybody can draw a picture how a monkey becomes a man. And I says, okay, it's fine if you want to believe that, I told this person. But I said, I, I just want to ask you something. I just want to say something here, I said. Look. I believe God created all things, I said. I believe God created me. I believe I need to give God honor and glory for everything. I believe God sent his son so he would shed his blood for me so I could have eternal life. And I believe what the Bible says, that if I repent of my sins and put my faith in Christ, God will give me eternal life. Now, you don't believe all of this. You believe that everything came from nothing, and once you die, then everything, is, that's, everything ends. And I said, okay, let's look at the, this a little bit. Now, if I believe what I believe, what consequences am I facing if I'm wrong? Well, no, nothing. Because I believe this, and even if you're right, I say, you're right and I'm wrong, there's no consequences for me. I can't lose. I said, but vice versa. If I'm right and you are wrong, there are great consequences. There are great consequences. And those are eternal hellfire. The consequences are, if you don't believe what Christ did for you, you will have to go and pay in hell for all eternity what Christ paid for you already. And you will yell, and you will yell and yell with your lungs wide open, I, and it will be too late. That's why God says salvation, today is the day of salvation. Hell is a real place. It's not for you. If you're listening online or if you're here, hell is not for you. But if you don't believe that God sent his son so you could have eternal life and put your faith in his son, then you will go there. According to the Bible. You will go. You know, man can believe life arose spontaneously from non-life, like I just said. That this world, beautiful world, just evolved. That to me is foolishness. The same as what I believe to others is foolishness. That is foolishness. Pride is an inherent part of man's fallen nature. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth pride as well. You know, it's all about self, isn't it? This world is filled with, filled with man's boasting, pride of intellect, pride of appearance, pride of education, pride of scholarship, pride of ancestry, pride of heritage, pride of race, pride of station, pride of achievement, pride of wealth, pride of possessions. There's pride in everything. Pride, a 
everything. Man thinks he can do all things himself and doesn't think that without God giving him the mind to be able to do things, he would do nothing. God should have honor and glory for all things. And yet man knows God. Even though he says he doesn't, he knows there's a God and does not glorify him as God and is not thankful to him. If there's someone that says, I don't know there's a God, I don't know God, you're lying to yourself because God's spirit testifies with our spirit, the Bible says, that there is a God. That there is a God. But the pride of life is not of the Father. The pride of life is not of the Father. The Son of God is meek and lowly in heart, Matthew 11.29 tells us. Philippians 2, 7 and 8 says, He took upon him the form of a servant and humbled himself. And those who are born into his eternal kingdom are characterized by humility as well. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5.5. 5. Amen? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. To gain true wisdom requires humbling oneself and acknowledge that the wisdom of this world is false. The only wisdom that is right comes from God. Only wisdom that is right comes from God. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 20, I'm almost done, says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Did we understand that? Read it again. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. The thoughts of the wise are empty, according to God. The wisdom of God is hidden to the wise of this world, meaning those who seem to be wise and think they are wise. We see here. And it is revealed to babes, we see as well, meaning those who have humbled themselves before God as needy sinners and who acknowledge they are not wise. Do we acknowledge we are not wise today? As believers, I believe we acknowledge we are not wise. Everything we have is from God. Everything. You know, I'm so thankful that I can know if it wasn't for God giving me a brain, I wouldn't be able to think. And there are so many people that ignore that fact. They think they are so smart. God is the one that gives wisdom. God is the one that gives wisdom. It says here in the... Uh, Matthew, Matthew eleven twenty five. I'll read it, says, At that time Jesus answered and said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast... Sorry, I'll read it again. And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. See, God has hid the truth from the wise and prudent, according to man. Those who think themselves to be wise are foolish. But those that acknowledge they're not wise, God makes wise. Amen? God gives us the knowledge to be able to know how to be saved. To a person that is not saved, the scripture is foolishness. To us, the scripture is a blessing. Amen? A blessing. I am so thankful that God used men to pray for me. 
that I could get to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am so thankful that God thought of us and gave us his word and preserved it through men that love his word. That we can have the preserved word of God in our hands today. We need to be thankful that God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And that we can glorify God as God. Amen? That we can glorify God as God. But because we can, we need to talk to others about this. And with this, I want to end. I want us to think If we see a person this week that doesn't know Christ walking down the street, then we know God still wants to save that person if he's not saved or she's not saved. Are we here this morning? We know this. See, an unsaved person is still breathing and God is still giving him him or her breath to live because God wants to save their souls. If they're still alive, there's still hope. Once they're dead, then there's no hope. But if they're still alive, God still wants to save their souls. So we need to pray for courage to be able to tell these people exactly what God wants us to tell them. And I thank Pastor Sawatsky for praying for, for, for uh, preachers. Uh, he sends me messages and he tells me, do you need anything special to pray for? Do you need me to pray for something special? I appreciate that because we need prayer so much, because we need courage. It is not easy to talk to these people that we see that are still alive and that might not talk so nicely to us when we talk to them about Christ. It's not an easy thing to do, but we need to do it. Because if we don't, there's a day of reckoning. Will their blood be on our hands if we don't talk? See how important it is? Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet because of one reason. Because he wants to save more people. Amen? He wants more people to be saved. He does not want them to go to hell and, and, and suffer there eternally. That's not why hell was create, made. It was made for the devil and his angels. God does not want one single person to go, so we need to be courageous. I read this week of some martyrs, some people that gave their lives, that were burnt at the stake. And they did not once falter. They glorified the Lord until the moment they couldn't anymore. Not once did they falter. I read about people that were put on a machine and that slowly someone was doing this and their arms were ripped out of their bodies. Reject Christ and you can live. How deep is our faith? We don't even really want to go out there and knock on doors and tell people about Christ. Some of us. Amen? We need to think about what God wants us to do and ask for courage. Pray for courage. Pray for one another at all times. And some probably already know, I pray every day that God will break you. Amen? And I need you to pray that God would break me. 
That's one of the things I asked Pastor Sawatsky to pray for, for the Lord to break me. 